This is uh, chapter two, measurement and problem solving. And this chapter will be broken into two parts just to make the videos a little shorter. We're gonna be talking about numbers a lot in chemistry. And one of the important things to recognize is how measurements are different from other types of numbers. And one difference is uh, the words accurate and precise. And um, we've used those kind of interchangeably. You're probably familiar with both of these words. But with measurements, they have a slightly different meaning. So accurate shows how much a number um, agrees with the true value. And precise agree with each other. So you can look at these um, these targets, and you can see that A is both accurate and precise uh, because they hit the right spot, that's accurate, and they're close together, and that's precise. And you see precise and not accurate, and neither accurate nor precise. Whole numbers are also different from measurements, and whole numbers are things that we count. So for example, Right here, we have seven pennies, and there's exactly seven pennies. It's not maybe 7.01 pennies, it's exactly seven. Seven is a whole number. But if you were talking about something like the mass of these pennies, if each mass has a, a mass of 2.5 grams, well, it might really be 2.507, and it, how you report that depends on how well you measured it. And that's the difference between a whole number and measurement. So when we get to measurements, significant figures are really important. So significant figures is a word that we're going to use a lot in this class. And all the calculations you do, you'll want to report your answer to the correct significant figures. And when you're making a measurement, it's always important to record the measurement as well as you can. And so the rule is to estimate one place beyond the marks. So this first ruler here is very ridiculous. Nobody has a ruler like that that basically has no marks at all. And so you just have to totally estimate the length of the bar. So let's go on to the second ruler where we have markings at the tens. So if you were going to measure this blue bar here, you know that you've got somewhere between the 20 and the 30. And so your estimate is the ones place. So I might call that 23 centimeters. So the two is where the marks are, and the three is the estimate between the marks. And then the last ruler is more typical of a way the ruler look, should look, and it has also, it has the marks between the 20 and the 30, okay? So in this, you can see that it goes to the 22 centimeters, but it's a little bit past that. Not quite to the 23, though, so I might call that 22.3 centimeters. So you can see the significant figures. In this number, we have two significant figures, and in this number, we have three. And we can record more digits because the measuring device is better, and that's what we're looking for in a measurement. You always want to record the best measurement you can based on that device, and in this case, um, the final one would give us 22.3. Now, would somebody else maybe call it 22.2? They might. That last number is an estimate. There's some error in it, but none of you are going to call it 22.8. So there's value in making that estimate, even though it's not perfect. The other thing we use significant figures for is in calculations. Um, so it's important to look at a number and know how many significant figures it has. And the rule is you start counting at the first non-zero digit and count all the rest. So for this first number, you don't want to count the zeros that start the number. They're not significant. They're just placeholders. You'll count the three and the five. So this one has two significant figures. The zeros are placeholders. They're not significant figures. On the next number, the very first digit is non-zero, and we do have a decimal, so we're going to count all of them. So that gives us one, two, three, four. This one has four significant figures. 
Number three, also it starts with the non-zero, so we can count all the digits. One, two, three, four. So this one has four significant figures. Number four is a number in scientific notation. We'll talk more about this, um, but scientific notation, whatever numbers are given in this portion are always significant. So we have three digits there. This has three significant figures. Five, one dozen. Well, one dozen is a whole number. And so really it has unlimited or infinite significant figures because it's a whole number. Uh, number six, we've got, it starts with a, a digit other than zero, so we, and it has a decimal, so we can count them all. That's five significant figures. And number seven is the trickiest one because it doesn't have a decimal. So big numbers that don't have a decimal, these zeros could be significant figures but they could just be placeholders showing how big the number is. So this one's hard to say. You have to just make a guess at it. Um, generally speaking, I would assume those zeros are placeholders and not significant. So probably call it one significant figure, but it's really not clear the way the number is written. So when we talk about scientific notation, I'll show you how you can avoid writing numbers. Big numbers with no decimal are ambiguous. So here's those answers written out. You can see number five is unlimited because it's a whole number. And number seven is ambiguous. You can't really tell for sure since there's no decimal. The reason counting significant figures in a number that's given is so important is that we often use the number in a calculation. And when you report the answer of your calculation, it's important to report that to the correct number of significant figures. And the thing that's kind of tricky about it is that we have a rule for multiplication and division, and we'll have a totally different rule for addition and subtraction. So you have to keep track of what type of operation you're doing so that you'll use the right rule. So let's start with multiplication and division. Um, and the simple way that I remember it is called count sig fix. So you're going to count how many signi significant figures are in your numbers in the operation, and that's going to limit what's in your answer, okay? So if we look at this problem, our first number, 278, has three significant figures, and we're dividing that by 11.70. That has four significant figures. So you just look at which is smaller, three or four. Well, three is smaller, so that's how many significant figures are in your answer. And so whatever your answer is, you round it to three significant figures. And we'll talk about rounding also. All right, so let's try some of these examples. And if you want to pause it and try them on your own and then turn it back on, that's a great idea. If you're not sure you know what you're doing, you can just watch it and try some other examples later. So example one, the first thing I'm going to do is just multiply those numbers on my calculator. So I have 23.1 times 1.9 times 104 Point three, and that gives me 4577.727. And that's a point. Decimal point. Sorry, my pen doesn't work very good. Okay. Um, so that's multiplying the numbers. The other thing you got to do is multiply the units. So I have centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. So that would give me centimeters cubed. Now the next thing I'm going to do is look at significant figures. So I look at my numbers in the problem. This number has three significant figures. This number has two significant figures. And this number has four significant figures. Okay, so what of those is smallest? Two. So our answer can have only two significant figures. All right, now that means I'm going to keep the first two. So I'm going to keep the four, I'm going to keep the five, I'm going to drop all the rest. But I can't just say 45 
as my answer. Do you see how it dramatically changed the number? You don't want to do that. And so what I need to do, well, first of all, I'm not going to call it 5 because the number I'm dropping is a 7. So if the number you're dropping is 5 or bigger, you increase this number. So I'm going to call it 46. And, um, and then I'm going to add placeholders, 0, 0. So let's make that a 6 and then centimeters cubed. And now I have one of those ambiguous numbers, so the best way to do that is write that one in scientific notation, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, next problem, same thing. I divided on my calculator, 8.03 divided by 1.3 equals, and I get 6.17692, and it goes on and on, okay? Um, and that's the number. Well, how many significant figures should I keep? Well, this number, 8.033, has four significant figures. This one, 1 1.3, has two significant figures. So I'm going to keep two. Keep the six, I'm going to keep the one. And then I'm going to drop all the rest. Okay, again, I'm dropping a seven. So that's big, five or bigger, so I'm going to call it six point two, rounding it up since I dropped a seven. And then again, the units, grams divided by milliliters is grams divided by milliliters. They don't cancel, so we just leave both the units. And here it is written a little more cleanly. Um, notice going to scientific notation on the 4.6 times 10 to the third, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Let's go on to the rule for addition and subtraction. So it's a completely different rule, but it's the same idea so that our answer reflects the amount of significance in our original measurements. So for this, I think about counting places past the decimal. So line up the numbers as if you were going to add them by hand. So for, for this problem, I have 5.74, and notice I'm just lining up this decimal. And then you look at how far can you go out where the number is significant. So 74, you see right there, the 4 is your last significant figure. This one goes out to the 3. This one goes out to the 1. But that hundredths place is the place where all of them have a significant figure. So that's where you draw this line, and that's where your answer is going to be rounded. Okay? Um, let's try that with some of these examples. Again, if you want to pause it and try them yourself first, you can do that. So I'm going to line up the decimal, 42.1 grams, 357 grams, and 0.22. Grams. Now notice on the units, when you're adding or subtracting numbers, they have to have the same units. So these are all grams. So now I go to my calculator, 42.1 plus 357 plus 0.22 equals, and I get 399.32. And the unit's going to be grams. All right, now where do I draw my line? Well, this number right here, the 7, that's what's going to limit us. That only goes to the 1's place. So I can only keep to the 1's place. So I draw my line right there at the decimal, and that's where I'm going to cut my number. I'm dropping a 3, that's less than 5, so I just keep the 399 grams is the correct answer. All right, let's try a subtraction. We have 10.1 milliliters minus 9.6 milliliters, okay? Um, and first of all, I'll do it on my calculator. 10.1 minus 9.6 equals, and I get 0 0.5, and the unit is milliliters. Now, both of these numbers go out to the tenths place. So I can keep all those places. I don't need to round my number. And my answer of 0 
0.5 milliliters is the correct answer. But notice what happened in this problem. I started with three significant figures and two significant figures, but I ended with just one significant figure. And that sometimes happens with subtraction um, because you might lose a place because the numbers are so close together. All right, and then this last one, another subtraction, 53.7 milliliters minus 29.7 milliliters. Okay, so I subtract those. I do it on my calculator, 53.7 minus 29.7, and I get 24. Okay? I can go out to the tenths place on both of these numbers. So notice, I can go one place past the decimal, but my answer doesn't have a digit there. And so I'm going to add 0. 0.0 because I can keep that place. That place is in both of my numbers, so I'm going to keep it there. It's still significant, okay? So my answer will be 24.0 milliliters, three significant figures. All right, so let's look at that a little cleaner. All right. If you are doing several operations together, then you follow the rules of order of operation. So in this problem here, the first thing you do is the parentheses, okay? So if I do that parentheses, I get 5.67 minus 2.3, okay? That gives me 3.37. Can I keep all those figures? Well, actually not, because when I did 5, 0.67 minus 2.3, notice I'm going to have to cut it right there. So I really can't keep the 7. I can keep the 3. I can keep the 3, which will really round to the 4, but I can't keep the 7. However, it makes more sense to round only once at the end. So this number, 3.37, is in my calculator. I'm going to use it to do my multiplication, but I'm going to remember that it's only two significant figures. So now on my calculator, I'm going to multiply times 3.489. So this number's already in it, times 3.489. And that gives me 11.75793. Can I keep all this? No. Okay. So this number here has four significant figures. This number here has two significant figures. It may look like it has three, but that seven isn't significant. So we use the two. And so since two is smaller, we're going to keep one, two, and cut the number right at the decimal. It's a seven. So we're going to round up and we're going to call it 12 is our answer. Now 12.0, that's adding a significant figure that you don't have. So that's when, what you do when you have multiple operations. And here it is a little bit more clean. And so we've talked a little bit about scientific notation. Let's talk in more detail how you do it. And I'm not going to talk about all the, the theory behind it, but it's based on powers of 10 and moving the decimal. Um, large numbers have positive exponents, small numbers have negative exponents. And a lot of people think of moving the decimal to the right, you get positive. I don't even know if that's right. I don't remember my right and left. Big numbers are positive. Um, so yeah, you moved it to the left for a big number and the right for a small number. So I just take the number, take the decimal where it is, and move it. So let's see, my pen's not working. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Move it till it's between the first and second digit. So I'll say 3.25. So I moved it there. Now the zeros, we're going to drop them because they're not significant. And then I'm going to add the exponent times 10 to the power of how many places I moved it, which was 9. 3.25 times 10 to the 9. And that's how you put a number in scientific notation. To take it out, it's just the reverse process. All right, small numbers, it's the same idea. Move the decimal from where it is 
to between the first and second. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I have four times 10 to the minus seven. This time it's minus because I've moved it because it's a small number, okay? Um, I don't say 4.0, the zero wasn't there. It, it doesn't belong there. There's not a significant figure. This number has one significant figure and you can see that reflected in the scientific notation. So with scientific notation, Whatever digits you have in this part of the number, those are your significant figures. And so this number would be ambiguous. You don't know how many significant figures it has, but once you put it in scientific notation, you can tell. So scientific notation is helpful for big numbers, small numbers, and numbers that the significant figures are not clear. So if they end at zeros, even if it's only one or two zeros, sometimes you need to go to scientific notation to make that clear. We'll be entering scientific notation on your calculator, and that's it's really important to know how to do that. So here's a picture of two um, calculators, the TI and the Casio, and there's many others, but a lot of um, calculators will look like this. And your button is either going to be the EE button that it is here or the EXP button that you see here. So if you have your calculator, pull it out, look for that button on your calculator. Um, in this case here, you can see that it's the yellow one, and that means you have to hit the second key first, and then that key, and that does the yellow function. Um, this calculator shows what it looks like, 6.02. The E means you hit the EXP key, and, um, and that's your exponent. So this EE or EXP replaces times 10. And that's really important to remember when you put it in your calculator, don't say times 10. You just say the number, well, you type the number, then you hit the exponent and enter the exponent. So let's see how that works here. All right, so doing this problem on my calculator, I just do the whole thing on my calculator. And so the buttons I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit 6.47 EE3 times 4.087 EE, the negative sign, and usually there's a button that is a negative sign, or a plus minus to change a sign, and then 8. Oh, that didn't turn out very pretty. And then divided by... 9.04 EE negative 2 and then your equals. So when I hit these numbers, let me do that. 6.47 EE3 times 4.087 EE negative 8 divided by 9.04 EE negative 2 equals, I get 0 0.00292509 Um Can I keep all those? What do significant figures tell us? Well, this one has three significant figures. This one has four. This one has three. We're using division so we can keep three. So the zeros aren't significant. I've got one, two, three. So I'll keep 0 0.0029. And since I'm dropping a five, I'm going to go up to three. Or we could put that in scientific notation. Take the decimal, move it three places. 2.93 times 10 to the negative 3. And both answers are fine. Um, a lot of times, either scientific notation or standard notation is fine. It's just whichever you prefer. So here it is a little bit more clean. We'll be using um, 
the metric system or the SI system most of the time in our measurements. And so here are some tables. There's similar tables in your book that you can use as well. Um, but for a lot of problems, it will be assumed that you know these measurements, that mass is kilograms or grams, length is meters, um, time is seconds, temperature is Kelvin, amount of a substance is a mole, and electric current and luminosity we won't um, be using. And then this table is really handy because it shows how to convert between English and metric. And you'll need to do that sometimes. Um, you'll be given the one and you need the other. And this table here is really important because it has the metric prefixes. So one thing that's really nice about the metric system is to go for a bigger unit or a smaller unit, it's very easy. You just add a prefix. Um, so for example, if you have a, a length that's much smaller than a meter, you might want to use the centimeter. Okay, and one centimeter is 0.01 meters. And so that's really handy. It, it's just a matter of moving a decimal, unlike the English system where it might be a conversion of say 36 or some number that's a little harder to multiply or divide. Um, when we talk about unit analysis, I'm gonna show you how to use these tables in more detail. So have these handy. They're also in your book. Um, Whichever, they're a little bit different in the book, so whichever you prefer, you can use those. Mass and weight are two other words that we often use interchangeably, but they're not exactly the same. So the mass of an object is a measurement of the quantity of matter, um, and that's measured with a balance. And the weight is the gravitational pull, and that's measured with the spring scale. So I put pictures of these two. So a balance, you put the thing you're weighing or measuring on one side, and you put your known weights on the other. So imagine if you were weighing, say, a watermelon. You put your watermelon on this side, and then you put your kilogram weights until it balances out. Um, and that is the mass. And the reason that's the mass is if you took this apparatus up to the moon, it would still be the same. Okay, it doesn't matter what the gravitational it pull is, the mass is going to remain the same. So the weight would be measured on this spring balance. And this is similar to what you see at the grocery store. If you put your watermelon in the pan and it pushes down a spring and changes the dial. And that tells you the weight, how much is gravity pushing on this watermelon. And if you took that to the moon, it would be different because it, the moon wouldn't push as hard on your watermelon. So that's the difference between mass and weight. We often use them interchangeably because we're here on Earth and, and they actually work the same, but that is the difference.